What's going on guys? Nick White, owner of Off Leash Canine, joined here by my partner Joe Zitzelberger. What up? For the dog show. What with is Nick going and Joe. on? How's it going? Where is uh, everyone out there watching from today? If you would comment below, let us know where you are at in the world so we can see what our demographics are to this uh, fine, amazingly cold. Dude, day. this this weather. It's Man, brutal. We, we gotta uh we gotta do something about this weather, huh? Super brutal. In Virginia at least. I don't know about where you guys are. Yeah, one of our uh, trainers in Phoenix uh did a Facebook post yesterday of him uh riding in uh riding his bike in his neighborhood with his dogs with a tank top and shorts on. And uh I was instantly pissed. <laughs> instantly. I mean it is if 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 you guys are Anywhere around the uh, this cold front that's over here on the East Coast right now, it is brutal. I mean, it is just awfully cold. I'm ready for summer. Insanely brutal at that. It's brutal for uh, people, so it's equally as brutal for your dogs. Yeah, no doubt. All right, so let's get in some news, Nick. What do you uh, What do you have uh, going on in the stories today? Yeah, I mean, speaking of the, the cold front that we were just talking about, there's actually, uh, I think it's the Animal Control Group in Saginaw, Michigan, that I saw in the news. The January 12th, they're actually going to spin the night out, like outside in a dog box to kind of raise awareness for leaving your pets outside. So the animal, there's like two or three animal control officers in Michigan that I saw the story on where they're going to go out, sleep in a dog box, like, you know, a legit yeah. dog box. Um, they said they're going to put down straw in the dog box. I think they're going to go out at like 6 or 7 p.m. and stay out till like 6 a.m. in order to help raise awareness for the effects of leaving your dog out in the cold. And I think that's uh, it's going to be pretty brutal for them, especially in Michigan. Like, I'm from Ohio, and it gets pretty brutal there. So it should be interesting. I think it's January 12th they're going to be doing this. So it should be pretty interesting to see that, how that, that plays is. out. I'd be interested to see, uh, see how that goes. Um, so I'm actually, I was actually last night kind of scrolling through uh, news stories on Google. And uh, man, if you type in, if you just go to Google right now and you type in uh, dog news, you are going to see dozens, dozens of stories of you know, this, this crazy uh, uh, winter storm we just had come through the East Coast. I, I believe it's still actually going on up north. Anyhow, yeah. but you will literally see dozens of dogs that have died due to uh, their owners being dicks and leaving them outside, chained to fences, and thinking that, uh, you know, they're going to be okay. And that is, uh, it's, it's insane to me, man. Like... Why leave your dog outside when you know you're going to have sub-zero temperatures, uh, snow, ice, and you legitimately believe that it's going to, your dogs are going to be okay? Like, they, they're literally finding dogs uh, frozen. Yeah, literally. Organs shut down, frozen. So, you know, here's my advice, guys. Don't be an asshole. That's, right? that's solid advice. Thank you. If it's cold outside, bring your fucking dog in. I mean, yeah. is it is it that difficult to do? I mean, it you shouldn't here, have a dog. Here's my and that's my theory. If if you <laughs> cannot bring your dog in the house for whatever reason, give them to somebody who can do it. Uh, you know, during winter storms, for God's sake. Anyhow, that is my number one story that I went over, which actually ends up being like a thousand. Uh, stories it seems like so yeah I've definitely seen that in the news a lot I also to kind of add to that saw I think it was in Florida I saw they were finding iguanas like <laughs> lizards and iguanas like 
frozen to trees and literally because they're just not used to temperatures like that yeah so yeah just don't be a dick if you have a dog bring them inside you know my my general rule of thumb for everything like when it's hot pavement when it's cold my rule is would i want to is this pavement hot enough where i would walk barefoot on it if not i don't take my dog on it is it cold enough out where i would want to sleep outside or be outside for a prolonged period of time. If not, I don't put my dog out there. And it's simple. If you don't leave your kids outside in the freezing cold with the winter storm going on, don't leave your dog outside. Yeah, and the problem is, uh, to, to add a little bit more to that, because I've heard this a lot. I mean, as a trainer, I speak with literally thousands of people a year about a wide variety of things in training. And the thing I hear about is like, oh, they're dogs, they're used to it. They're not used to it. They're an inside dog. Just like you're an inside person. If you're a person, like an Eskimo that lived outside or something your whole life, you're used to it and your body's adapt and all this. But if you're an inside dog that's used to 70 degrees in year round inside the house, they're no more used to it than you are. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and what we'll do is once we end this, I actually have a really good picture that shows you like the general safe, unsafe temperatures for your dog. Hmm. So it'll say based off this being your breed of dog or the size of dog, this is the temperatures that it's safe for your dog. This is the temperatures where it's questionable and this is the, the temperatures where it's no longer safe. So I'll post that in the comments below once we finish up this. Yeah, and we'll also post the uh, news stories up on our uh, on our website, which is the dogshowpodcast.com. Um, so what else you got? What else you got in the news? Yeah, you know, speaking of the cold, I noticed <clears throat> that my <clears throat> it, it affects like my iPhone. You know, I noticed like when it was really cold out yesterday, my iPhone was like slow motion. You know, I'm talking. Have you yeah. experienced that? Yeah. Where you see it like kind of warping into the next zone? And it made me think, like, what's your thoughts on iPhone coming out saying that they pretty much purposefully slow down older phones? Dude, what, do you, what do you think about that? I have been calling this shit for as long as I've had an iPhone. And, and I don't think it's just me. I think it's everyone. We've yeah. all been calling this. Like, new iPhone comes out, all of a sudden, yours goes to crap. And it can only be one thing, right? Yeah, it can only be that they are uh, trying to get us to upgrade to the new phone. But anyhow, so I guess what the story is, is they finally admitted it. I, I didn't read into it. Yeah, so pretty much this like teen, this like 16, 17 year old kind of did some investigative reporting and he found out somehow, I mean, he's a tech kid and he found out like, hey, this is definitely something that's going on. Uh, and he posted a Reddit about it and it got a ton of exposure and then Apple pretty much came out and said, yeah, you know, with your lithium ion batteries in your phone, we kind of slow them down when new models come out. And I think they're kind of trying to backtrack saying they're doing it to prolong the life of the phone, but it is what it is at the end of the day. Pretty much the new iPhone 7 comes out. If you got an iPhone 6, you notice it starts crashing, it's slowing down. So what do you do? You buy the new iPhone. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not buying into it this year. I didn't get it. Did you get the new one? Uh, I have the iPhone 7 Plus, but I did not get like the 8 or the yeah. iPhone Generation XV or what, yeah. whatever it was. I think I read that they're going to actually, uh, they came down on the price for the battery. So I think I'm just going to do that because I as well have the 7 Plus and I'm just going to get a new battery. And... Problem solved and... Tell Apple to screw off. Yep, screw you, Apple. Yeah, it's pretty genius, <laughs> though, if you think about it. It really is. And, you know, it, it was just a matter of time before they got caught in, you know, so... They've had a good run. It is what it is. So, I have a, kind of a cool story here. Um, <laughs> a dog snatched uh, by an eagle in Pennsylvania Yard found alive miles away. Dude, I saw that. How crazy is that? <laughs> So this, I guess this kid's out walking his dog and here comes this, uh, this eagle and it snatches up this Bichon and the, the kid was interviewed <laughs> by the local news and said that, uh, that he thought he was hallucinating. 
And apparently, I mean, I don't know, I didn't read all the way into it, but apparently the Eagle did finally, I don't know if he landed him softly. <laughs> he landed him. Or he, <laughs> he dropped, just dropped him, him. In, in midair. Uh, regardless, uh, the dog's okay. And, uh, yeah, I think they're going to be a little bit uh, more careful when, when letting their dog out. So, anyhow. So, yeah, when, when, I, when I saw that story, I started reading into it a little bit, and... What had happened, well, what they estimate happened is, again, due to this cold weather that we're having, right, is they live next to a, a creek or a stream, those people, and that stream has frozen up, which it normally doesn't. So what they f think, the, the theory is, since the stream's frozen up that the eagle's used to going to for its source of food, now it's just, that's frozen up. So what it's doing is it's looking for an alternative source so it's just flying around the neighborhood, sees this like, I don't know, what was it, 8, 10, 12 pound Bichon? And it's like, good enough for me. It's... And it just flies down. It's like, how crazy well, is that? I've heard, you know, I've actually done, uh, I did two uh, Yorkies for the boarding train program probably about five years ago. And the owner uh, insisted that I did not take the dogs <laughs> outside. I swear. I'm, that was like her fear? She, I could not. They had pee pads uh, in their kennel, and she did not want her dogs outside because she feared of whether it was eagles or larger uh, birds picking them up and taking them away. So, to, dude, to be honest, we have now 320 trainers in off leash canine training. If one of my trainers said I was out working a dog and eagle snatched down and flew away with it, prior to this, I would have never believed it. I mean, would you? No, I mean. Especially like a tent, it's not like a teacup Yorkie. I don't even know if I if I still believe it, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> I, I kind of want to see the video. I mean, now that we know the dog's okay, I kind of wish there was a video so we could watch it. I mean, that would definitely uh, be something to see. So, uh, what else you got? Um, what else? What else? Uh, well, speaking of, you know, we had a lot of Christmas dogs, I'm sure. Because every year, as you know, there's a ton, an influx of... Of dogs being, new puppies. yeah, new puppies and influx, yeah. you know, people's buying them for their girlfriend, for their mom, their dad, their brother, their sister, their neighbor. Um, and I think it's important what we want to talk about a lot today. What I think is important is that people, I, I don't think, think that there's a process to get, ensure you're getting the right dog for you. Like we see that all the time as trainers. I would say, I mean, what would you say? Would you say 50% of people you don't think? feel like got the dog that's right for them? What would your kind of estimate be based off what you see? Um, man, that's a, that's a solid question. I'd, I'd probably go higher than 50%. Really? You think higher? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Um, you know, for me, it's, it's a lot of, uh, trying to just figure out what kind of lifestyle you live yeah. as a human, you know, are you energetic? Do you like to be out you know, hiking a lot, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, if so, you should get a, a dog that kind of matches your energy and, and, you know, be honest with yourself. If you're, if you're a lazy bum who likes to lay on the couch all day, <laughs> bum. then, you know, don't get a out. You know, yeah. I mean, that's, that's enough said that's on that. probably not a good mix. So, I mean, that would be, that would at least be my, uh, initial interpretation of, what kind of dogs to stay away from or what kind of dogs to get based off of the energetic or non-energetic lifestyle that you may or may not and have. And I feel like, to, to clarify, I feel like like you gave an example of two extremes, like the lazy bum, that's one extreme, yeah. and then you got a mal, that's another extreme, where I don't feel like most people fall into those extremes. I feel like it's general, like, well, well, we hear all but the people do fall in. Oh, yeah, we've seen it. We've seen it for sure, unfortunately. But what I feel like most people fall into is what we see, I would say, the most is people that they got the German Shepherd. Like We literally got an email from this yesterday. I could pull it up. Uh, and they want to do protection with it. Shout out to that person who emailed us yesterday. <laughs> and... They got a German Shepherd from lines or a rescue or a shelter or a breed or wherever they got it from. And within eight seconds of seeing that dog, I'm like, there's a 0% chance this dog will ever be a protection dog. And now they're stuck with this dog for 15 years that they got 
for this specific purpose and that dog will never ever ever fulfill that purpose yeah and then we see the same with the reverse yep. where they want a therapy dog or an emotional support dog for their daughter or a service dog for their son or whatever and they show up with a borderline working line German Shepherd dog and now that dog will never fulfill that purpose that they got it for and they're stuck with that dog for 15 years or they take it to the shelter which everyone hates and um, so I, I'd love to spend some time us discussing that well um, and, and you know kind of in and based off that in my opinion you know we're all we're right now currently talking about specific breeds and to me and you may disagree with this, Nick, but to me, it, the breed is pretty irrelevant. I mean, not completely irrelevant, obviously. Because there are yeah, c- certain characteristics tend to go with a breed. Right, but I, I mean, know. you can go to a shelter if you if, you know if you want to rescue a dog. Because we're not saying, guys, go out if you want a therapy dog, go get a uh, you know a golden retriever or a lab. You know, uh, you could easily go to you know a humane society or SPCA or whatever and. You know, you can actually spend time with this dog, you know, to figure out what kind of energy level it has, you know, uh, what kind of manners it has. Does it have any obedience? What's the history of the dog? So you can get all of these things that you're looking for in a rescue dog uh, for sure. It doesn't have to be breed specific, you know. I've seen, you know, German Shepherds, you know, as you were just talking about that, you know, or kind of balls to the wall, you know, fifth gear drive all the time. And then I've seen German Shepherds that just kind of lay around all day. Yeah, they would be a good therapy dog. Right. So, I mean, I definitely want to touch on today, you know, what what are we looking for? Maybe not necessarily breed, but qualities. What qualities are we looking for, Nick? Yeah, so so the the first thing is, what I would recommend is decide, the first thing that you need to do is decide, what am I getting a dog for? That's, I think that's the first step in everyone's calculation is, what am I getting getting a dog for? And do I have time, you know, be honest with yourself, and do I have time for that dog? That's the most important thing, but you have to decide, what do I want a dog for? Do I want a dog to be a personal protection dog and I want to do bite work with them or Schutzen or French ring or Mondio or something like that? Or do I want a therapy dog? Cause I want to go visit, you know, in the weekends, I want to go visit places like Walter Reed and take the dog and help, you know, cheer up the wounded warriors and stuff there. Or do I want a service dog? Cause I have epilepsy or, you know, diabetic issues or a detection dog or tracking dog. So I think the, the, The first thing you have to do once you know you have time for a dog is decide what do I want this dog for and then go into the next step which is finding the right dog for specifically what you want the dog for. Yeah, no doubt. And, and, you know, another thing that you got to consider is where do you live? You know, consider that. That, that, That's a huge factor. If you live in, you know, Washington, D.C. in a high-rise apartment, let's be realistic. You probably shouldn't have a working line dog, a working line, you know, in personal protection or something like that to where they require, you know, this much physical energy to be exhausted every day. You know, um, if they only have a small little area in, in the courtyard where they're allowed to run yet, you know, there's a lot of yappy dogs surrounding them all the time. They, you know, they really have nowhere to run and play fetch or, you know, whatever he likes to do, you have to take that into consideration. So, you know, that's definitely something that, and also climate, I think climate is big, you know, um, you know, obviously we see Huskies in Florida and we see, you know, Huskies in, you know, Texas and Arizona. I saw them last year. I saw them in Hawaii even, so. I'm I'm not a fan of that though, man. Like, I feel like those dogs need to be in colder climate states. You know, the Minnesotas, Alaska, you know, northern New York, uh, you know, Maine, you know, states like that to where they're almost in their element, you know. If you get a a Tamascan or, you know, a Malamute or something, you stick it in the middle of South Florida, you know, for his entire life. Obviously, he's going to get used to it after a while, but I mean, it's it's just not in their element. So they're not going to have that typical Malamute energy and personality that they normally would because, in my opinion, they're just not in their element. And I always feel bad, like when I'm 
out even in Virginia, because I mean, it's hot as shit in our state. Or Phoenix. Oh, my God. Vegas. Right. And, and you see somebody walking their dog and, you know, it's it's this huge, fluffy, hairy thing and it just looks miserable. Um, now, again, I'm, that's not the case for every single one of them, but it, it, you can't deny, right, that that is the case uh, for several of them. You know, some of them just can't adapt and, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, it is what it is. So, yeah. And so, as I said, I would say the first thing that you need to do is find the reason that you want a dog. And then your second thing that you need to do is uh, go out and find that dog, whether you're using a breeder, whether you're using a shelter, whether you're using a rescue, you know, I'm not one of those people that's going to sit here and yell at you and tell you that, you know, no matter what, you should always adopt, don't shop, because that's not always the case. Some of the cases, some of the times that's true, some of the times it's not true. It depends on what you're looking for. But regardless of where you get the dog, breeder, shelter, rescue, anything, is you can test these dogs as puppies. You know, a, a kind of a good general rule of thumb that people don't realize is however a dog is at eight to 10 weeks is generally how they're gonna be at one to four years old. A lot of people don't realize that. And you can tweak that some because there's, you know, social environment, there's training, there's confidence building. There's a bunch of things that you can do or not do as an owner to affect that throughout their life. But in general, what you see at eight weeks old is pretty much going to be what you see at two years old. And a lot of people don't realize that. So there, there's a, a really good test, a, a puppy aptitude test. There was a, a breeder, I think German Shepherd breeder named Wendy and Jack uh, Volhard may have mispronounced it, that created this puppy aptitude test that I consider highly, highly accurate. I'll actually post, uh, after we finish this, we'll put up that test on our website, thedogshowpodcast.com, and it's literally a checklist test that you do with puppies at eight weeks old, and you can do it with adults as well, but you can do this test, and at the end of the test, you total up the score, and it'll tell you this is the type of dog that this dog is based off the score. Based off this score, this dog is a high drive, high dominant, alpha, high energy dog. And if he's that way at eight weeks, that's how you can exactly how you can expect he's going to be at two years old. That needs, you know, an experienced handler, an experienced owner. Or that test will say based off all these calculations that you've done and these fill in the blanks you've done, this dog is a highly submissive, fearful uh, you know, may possibly be a fear biter in its future. It'll, it'll tell you this is the type of dog. This dog would be good for a therapy dog. This dog would be good for a protection dog or a working dog. This dog is always going to be a fearful, high anxiety dog. So um, we'll post that up here, but it's a really, really good test that'll give you a great baseline foundation to tell you what type of dog you're getting. And that's kind of what drives me crazy is if some people just did this test at eight weeks before they brought the dog home, they would have known that it's the wrong dog for them. And you almost got to take, I mean, you almost got to take emotions out of it, right? Because of course we walk in to, you know, test this puppy or whatever. And we see, you know, we see that, you know, the dog, you know, really doesn't pass any of our tests of what we're looking for in a dog. But he's cute as shit. But he's cute as shit. <laughs> so it's like, oh, you know, I can't leave him here in the shelter. But, you know, be realistic with yourself. You know, can you provide what this dog needs? And, you know, can this dog provide what you're looking for in a pet? So, you know, those are huge, huge factors that I actually 100% uh, agree with you with. Yeah, and, and that's like one of my biggest pet peeves that people don't realize is, and it's, it, you know, if you think about it, it sucks for the dog and it kind of sucks for the owner because now the dog's stuck with an owner that isn't going to use him for what he got him for. And now the owner's stuck with the dog for the same exact reason. Um, so you can literally do this test at eight, nine, 10 weeks old. You can do it with adults and it'll generally, because there's exceptions to every rule, but in general, it's, I think it's very accurate and it'll tell you exactly what type of dog that you're getting. And it's, you know, a, a, a test that kind of gauges, you know, certain things like social attraction, following, restraint, social dominance, retrieving, like based, and you literally, it's, it's numbered one through six. And so you'll test his socialization, like did the dog initiate contact with you? Did he stay with you? Uh, did he nibble on your hands 
when he was initiating contact with you, that shows he's probably a little more drivey. Did he lick? Did he not look at you? Okay, based off what this dog did, uh, he's a number three. And then you move on to the next one, like make a loud noise. How did the dog react to the noise? Number one, he didn't care. Number two, um, he looked at it, but didn't pay much attention to it. And then, you know, number six is like, he took off running in the opposite direction, refused to come back. So you just circle these and at the end of this test, it'll tell you based off your total score, this is the type of dog that this is, whether it's high drive dominant. This dog is chill, mellow, not affected by much, and he would be a good therapy dog. This dog is super skittish, super fearful, will probably end up being a fearful, skittish, potential fear biter dog, would not be good at a working dog or a therapy dog. So um, we'll post that on our website. It'll be up today. Again, that's the dogshowpodcast.com. And I would highly suggest everyone print it out. I actually added to the test um, to throw that disclaimer in there. I took the original test and I added to it for tracking and I added to it for detection. So people that are looking for a potential tracking or detection dog, I added those tests in there of my personal thoughts on what I would look for as a puppy. So you can test protection, tracking, therapy, detection, or just this dog is a great pet for an average first time owner, essentially. And, and you know, to kind of go off of that, if, if you're not gonna walk into this place with a, a test form <laughs> and, and you're not, you know, you're realistically not gonna do this test, then, you know, write a list of things down uh, to look for on your own that are important to you, you know? Um, if, especially if you're going into a rescue or an SPCA or something, you know, is, is uh, a dog already potty trained important to you? You know, y you may think to yourself, oh, it doesn't matter. I can potty train it. But what happens if, you know, you don't have the time to potty train it and then, you know, you struggle with that and you get frustrated and then ultimately the dog's going back to the shelter. So, you know, make a list and, and guys, there's actually... Um, a lot of rescues and shelters that offer uh, foster first programs where you can actually take the dog in and foster it, quote unquote, um, for an unset amount of time to figure out if it's a right fit for you. And something with humans, man, where I feel like that's probably a psychological thing. Like if you were to go to a shelter, you tell me what you think on this, Nick. If you were to go into a shelter and say, yeah, I want to adopt this dog right here. And you get that dog back home. And after, I don't know, maybe three, four weeks, you're like, man, this dog is definitely not the right fit for my family, but I'm his owner and I feel bad and I don't want to give up on him. So I'm going to keep, you know, pretty much making all of us, including the dog miserable because it's not the right fit, you know? So Whereas if you foster a dog, right? Are you following here? If you, if you foster a dog and three, four weeks go by and it's not the right fit, then psychologically us as humans, I feel like we would be like, oh, well, you know, I'm just fostering. So it's okay to give this dog back to yeah. the shelter. So if, if your rescue or shelter has that option, then by all means, I mean, take advantage of that. You know, I think that's a, that's a really, really great option. Yeah, I would agree. And like I said, guys, it's so common that we see this so much. We have people who want that German Shepherd or Doberman or whatever it is, or Rottweiler to be a protection dog. And literally within five seconds of evaluating that dog, and I'm brutally honest, like I'm nice about it, but brutally honest. I'm like, yeah, this dog is never, ever going to be a protection dog. So you ever thought about nose work or <laughs> you ever thought about therapy dog or anything like that? Um, but it's just so common and it's just, you know, do your research. If you're getting a dog from a breeder, do your research on the breeder. Like I personally always would love, ideally, it's not always possible because depending on where you're getting the dog, but I would love to meet, you know, the parents of that dog because that's another thing people don't consider. Like I talked about a little bit, I touched on it in the podcast we did last week where scientists estimate that 40% of a dog's temperament is genetics. So yeah. if the, the parents of that dog was highly aggressive and super unsocial and skittish, then there's a high chance that that's affecting this dog. And again, if you did this test, then you could kind of help 
rule that out in the beginning, but so it's just, you know, as I always say, people are like dogs. Genetics plays a big part in it. One of my really good friends, someone that I look up to greatly, he was actually on the Facebook Live. Uh, he did a Facebook Live with me like a year ago, if you guys get a chance, watch it, is world-renowned bird dog trainer, George Hickox. Yeah. I had him on with me. Great uh, Facebook Live, if you guys get a chance. But one of the things I stole from George is he says, to make a great dog, it takes like the best dog, it takes three components, which is genetics, nutrition, and training. He said, if you eliminate any one of those three, it's gonna have a negative effect. Um, so he's like, the three things you have to have in amazing dogs, genetics, nutrition, and training. And this is to be like a top, top dog. You know, not to be like a pet dog or anything like that, to clarify. And where I saw this most at is I spent what was it, like a week in Alaska a couple years ago? Oh, my God. And it was brutal, guys. It was negative 40. I actually thought about that yesterday when I was freezing my ass <laughs> off. I was like, dude, it was like literally 50 degrees colder, colder where you were uh, filming that show. Yeah, it was brutal when I was there. I was doing the show called Escape to Alaska, um, and it was negative 40. It was brutal. And I got the honor, the privilege, everything you can say to work every day for a week with Jeff King. For those of you guys that don't know, Jeff King is Iditarod Hall of Famer, three-time Iditarod winner. He's, pun intended, he's the top dog in this field, like a legend. When we went out to like Alaska, when we would go out to dinner, literally like people are swarming like for pictures and stuff with him. He's like a legend in Alaska. Oh, yeah. He's a three-time Iditarod winner, Iditarod Hall of Famer. For sure. And he pretty much said the same exact thing with George without breaking it down to those three basic things. But, you know, he's known to have some of the top dogs. And he's like, well, what I do is my champion dogs that won the Iditarod, my lead dog, I breed that dog with another lead dog. And then, so he's got the best genetics. And then he does nutrition. He's never fed them like kibble. Like they eat like hu like humans, like huge stew, pots, you know, meat. Like that's what they're, they're feeding them. And then they're training, you know, they're hitting the treadmill. They're pulling sleds. They're pulling ATVs. During the spring when there's not snow, he hooks them to ATVs and he just puts it in neutral and they're pulling him on an ATV. So genetics, nutrition, and training pretty much what Jeff said and what George said, I agree is the, the three key main elements once you get into high level dogs. And for pet dogs, as I said, you just gotta ensure that it's an actual good pet dog. So what you're saying is you wouldn't take one of those sled dogs and adopt them out to a, uh, somebody that lives in New York City by any chance? No, <laughs> yeah, or like downtown Phoenix or Las Vegas where it's 130 every day. And, and then another thing to consider, guys, when looking for a dog or a puppy is I mean, you got to be realistic with yourself. Can you afford it? You know, there's so many. I, I would love to know the stats on this, and maybe somebody can look it up or I'll look it up later, um, of how many dogs are surrendered uh, to shelters and stuff because they just couldn't afford it. You know, whether, you know, they didn't realize that, you know, a Great Dane eats 12 cups of food a day <laughs> and they, you know, can't afford to buy a new bag, you know, once a week. Or maybe you have a, a dog that's, you know, high maintenance and requires, you know, weekly or bi-weekly grooming, you know. These are things to consider and, and you should always, you know, I always recommend if you have a dog, you should have an account like dedicated to that dog for an oh shit scenario you know i mean honestly yeah. i mean you know god forbid you get a puppy and puppy eats a rock and has to have surgery to get the rock removed you know that we're looking at three grand so what happens if you don't have the three grand you know what i mean because i'm here to tell you the vets aren't going to say okay well we'll do it anyway you know that's not how they operate you know they're a for-profit business so you know, as sad as that is, but you know, you, you have to be realistic on the cost of owning an animal. Um, it, it's, it's expensive, especially if there's medical issues involved or, you know, they, they come up over time. So it's definitely something you want to consider. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't consider the, the, the things and just the time. I think that's the biggest thing people don't consider is the time. Um, that do you have the time to commit to that dog? And if you get like a lazy dog that's 
just content laying around the house all day, then sure, it works out. But again, that's why we're stressing the importance of getting the right dog and being honest with yourself and getting the right dog that truly matches your lifestyle. If you're an outdoors person that runs you know, triathlons and you do 10 mile hikes every day, then you may not want to get that lazy bulldog or golden retriever that just wants to lay around all day and now you got a dog that you can't do anything with and then vice versa as joe said if you're the lazy bum that just sits around your house all day you probably don't want to get you know a belgian malinois from you know one of the top kennels in holland so just be honest with yourself and get a dog and i feel like i was actually on the board of directors still am for the prince william county humane society and i feel like a lot of the dogs that get returned are mismatched dog and owner things like that or or the time they just decide they didn't have them it's like oh the dog's tearing stuff up in my house well, that's because he's not getting exercise because you're not putting the time or he's not getting exercise because he's a high energy dog that needs exercise and you're not a high energy person to give him exercise so a lot of the dogs you know i think the actual number in general the aspca is like 20 percent 20% of the dogs that are getting from an animal shelter are given back to a shelter, which is super high. Yeah. I mean, that's one out of five. And I feel like if people were honest with themselves and tested the dogs um, that, that I was talking about, that number would probably, between being honest with themselves and testing the dogs to make sure it was the right dog for them, I feel like that number would drop 50% or more. And, I mean, the truth is, is the rescues and the shelters also have to do a better job, you know, in, in the breeders. They have to do a better job at, yeah. at, at selecting families, you know. It's not, it's not always about, hey, we got 70 dogs in the shelter and we need to get them out as quickly as possible. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the truth is, is that, you know, some of those dogs that you adopt out probably have or had a better life in the shelter than they do where they're going. So, you know, you got to take that into consideration. There's also some other things that, you know, sometimes are overlooked, especially if you're adopting and rescuing and stuff like that. Um, you know, what's important to you, you know, or manners important to you, you know, when you go meet this dog, does he jump on you? But is that one of your pet peeves? You know, you got to consider that. Do you have a cat? You know, if you have a cat, you got to make sure this dog is tested with cats yeah. first because, I mean, that could be a bad day, right? So, um, you know, check that off the list. Check the drive. You know, Kids. Kids, potty train. To me, that's a huge, huge one. I know one thing for sure. Um, I have enough uh, dogs right now, as you know, um, so I won't be getting any anytime soon. <laughs> but when, uh, you know, years down the road, when I am ready to, uh, you know, adopt another dog, uh one thing that I'm really big on, I don't want to potty train. I I despise <laughs> potty training. The process of potty training. I mean, it is like having an infant for the first six months. I mean, you always got to keep an eye on the dog. You know, you got to get up throughout the night. So, you know, th that's a huge thing, at least for me, to consider when adopting a dog is, is it already potty trained, you know, and, and, if possible, and, and I'm ready to adopt a dog, if possible, I'm going to do a foster first program. I want to ensure that this dog's going to be, you know, the right fit for my family. Yeah. So, um, you know, that just a lot of these things, guys, are common sense. But I feel like that... You would think. the. I mean, yeah, but, you know, the excitement takes over, and I yeah. get that. You know, you, 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 especially if it's a family's first uh, dog, first pet. Uh, they get to the shelter, they get to the rescue, they get to the breeder, and they see these cute puppies, these cute dogs, and emotions take over yeah. everything. They're like, oh, he's so cute. You know, he loves me. Oh, look, he's chewing on my pants. How cute is that? That's probably not cute. <laughs> you know, it may be cute while he's eight weeks old. Or but, if you're looking for a working dog, it's cute. Right, but assuming you're <laughs> not, you know, it, it may be cute when the when the puppy's eight weeks old, but, you know, when, when he turns 85 pounds and you haven't gotten it any formal obedience training uh, for whatever reason, maybe you can afford it or, you know, it just never happened. You never, you know, looked into it. And he's 80 pounds and he's chewing on your kid's pants, you know, that that's not cute anymore. Now, you know... You have other issues going on. And, and then the problem with that, guys, that I feel like uh, that happens way too often is uh, we as owners, we hold on to the dogs, um, you know, when we know it's not the right fit 
for our family and we hold on to them as long as we can until maybe they're three, four, five, six, seven years old. And then we finally just get fed up and say, I can't do it anymore. And you give them to a rescue. Well, now you've just developed a pants biting or shirt biting or whatever, uh, you know, for five, six, seven years. So when you go to a reputable training company and you should be going for just normal obedience, now it's almost like a rehab program. Now you got to unfuck pretty much everything that that family did for six or seven years, all because they felt bad. So, you know, my point in this is, you know, say you went through the test, say you did everything you were supposed to do, right? And you get home and you find out that it's just not a good fit. Don't wait. You know, it, you're actually doing the dog more damage by waiting and trying to stick it out versus giving them back to the shelter or, you know, trying to adopt them out yourself to somebody else, to a, a family that's almost essentially a better fit, you know, so you owe it to that dog that that you adopted or rescued or bought uh, to make sure that, that they have the best life possible. Because again, as I said in last week's show, Nick, um, you know, it's not their fault why we domesticated them, right? So that's kind of my theory on that. So you know, we owe it to them to give them the best life possible as close to their primal needs as possible uh, with obviously not allowing them to go absolutely crazy, you know, in the house and stuff. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and you know, the, the, the big thing too is if you're looking to get from like a breeder, I have a really good friend that's a breeder, Stephanie O'Brien. She breeds some of the Best Mal's, really good Malinois. She lives in California. She's actually a, a trainer at Off Leash as well. And there's things that you need to look for when it comes, if you're going to get from a breeder, to look for that you ensure it's a good breeder. Like, a breeder shouldn't let you just pick one of their dogs. A good breeder shouldn't let you pick one of their dogs off pictures on their website. Like, oh, I want the one with a blue collar. And they're like, all right, great, he's yours. Because they should want to match it you know, with you, they should want to say, well, let's come in. Let me talk to you. They should pretty much want to do what I just told you. Like, what's your lifestyle? Like, okay, based off what you told me, I know the blue one you think is uh, prettier, but the one with the orange collar, Jax, he's actually the, the more realistic one for your lifestyle. So that's one of the first red flags I would say to look out for is, is if there's a breeder who's like, yeah, just show up. You can have whichever one you want without doing, you know, any application process without doing any background on you. Like, what's your home like? Do you have a fenced in yard because these dogs are high energy. They need a lot of exercise. You know, like Stephanie, someone can email Stephanie and say, I love that Mal. I'll give you $10,000 for it right now. She's gonna be like, what's your experience? Are you a trainer? Are you a handler? Yeah. Like, what's your experience with Malinois? Like, she's just not gonna let someone that shows up with a pocket full of money take one of her dogs because she has those dogs' best interest in her mind and has your best interest in mind. She knows that if you're a new owner that's never had a dog before, an inexperienced handler, that one of her mouths is gonna drive you literally insane and you're just gonna end up screwing up the Malinois and she's gonna get it back anyway. So things that you wanna look for in a good breeder is like, what's their application process like? Um, are they, educational or are they saying here's what you should look for what's your lifestyle like and so those, those are some of the things that you should be looking for when you seek out a breeder read reviews on them you know read you know google their name see what other people in forums are saying on them don't just find a dog that looks cute and have it shipped to you we've seen that a lot yeah i'm like oh where'd you get this dog They're like oh we got it from a breeder in pennsylvania i'm like oh that's awesome did you guys drive out there did you fly out there and they're like well no we saw it online and they just flew the dog to us like you should never do that that breaks every rule that i've spent the last 10 minutes telling you yeah absolutely and and when we say breeders guys there's a huge huge difference between you know, reputable, good breeders that breed for specific needs and wants versus backyard breeders. Your brother in Alabama that does fuck, it that does it in his trailer park. Fuck him. Yeah. Right. I don't support that and if anybody has an issue with that, I apologize, but I don't care because that is one of this country's, you know, biggest problem with the with the 
dogs and shelters is these backyard breeders one have zero clue what they're doing when it comes to breeding right i mean i'm not a breeder so i don't know the exact process of how to you know keep the uh, genetic line going um but i mean i have a, a pretty i guess solid idea either way i'm still not a breeder you know but these backyard breeders they're just doing you know they're just trying to make a quick four or five hundred bucks and like Every time somebody, a client, and I could get ridiculed for this, but whatever. Every time a client said, you know, I always ask, where'd you get the dog? You know, I want to, I want to know as much about the dog as possible, you know, for the one I'm training. And, and they automatically say, oh, I paid 500 even. I automatically assume it was a backyard breeder. I don't know why that is. Um, I just feel like, you know, well-bred, uh, you know, um, any kind of breed, really, the shepherds, the bulldogs, whatever, the well-bred ones, they're going to cost more than $500, yeah. guys. I mean, that, that that's... You get what you pay for. That's somebody who is trying to make a quick buck. You know, they have... They, they bought a German Shepherd or adopted or whatever. They thought it looked pretty, so they got another one, you know, of the opposite sex. Thought that one looked cute, and they bred them, and then all of a sudden, you know... Bam. Now they have 12 puppies. They're selling them for 500 bucks a piece. But what they don't realize is that maybe they bred uh, anxiety into these 12 yeah, puppies. Or aggression. Or, or aggression or something like that. So, you know, it, you have to definitely, Nick touched on this earlier, you know, do your research on the breeders. I cannot stress that enough. You know, don't support these these guys out here and ladies, of course, that are out there just trying to make a quick dollar because these are the people that are flooding our shelters. You know, they're the reasons why there are, you know, I think over 70 dogs right now in the Fredericksburg SPCA, you know, the, not the sole reason, but they're a large reason of it. So, you know, definitely do your research on the breeders. Yeah, and I'll probably take some, some flack for this, but it's just true. And, uh, or my experience at least, is what I found is people that get dogs from the Amish, um, like in Pennsylvania and stuff, they're generally not good dogs. Mm. And uh, and I'm sure there's probably someone watching that got one from them who's going to comment that they, they got one and it's the best dog they've ever had. And it's the most confident, social, savage dog they've ever had in their life. But my experience is dogs that people get from the Amish because they're usually cheap, um, they're they're not good they're not good genetically they're not good temperament i see a lot of fear issues i see a lot of like nervous issues i see a lot of social ability issues and it's just and i don't know this so you know no one quote me on this but i just don't feel like they, they do the right things with the dogs so what do you think what do you because i mean i I've, I've gotten that a lot too where they got their dogs from the amish and i'm uh, you know I, I don't know a whole lot about that but what do you think drives people to uh, to go up to Amish country to get a German Shepherd, like because in their minds they're actually going to a reputable breeder. Yeah, so they what, don't know any better. Is it is it the Amish that are just selling them and they're not you know they're just used car salesmen? You know, is that the case? What what do you what do you what do you think? Um, I think they're cheap. I think, and I don't know this, but I think people look online. Maybe we'll say German Shepherds, Aussies, whatever. They look at a few different websites. They come across one on like petfinder.com that looks adorable. It's in, you know, Lebanon, uh, Pennsylvania, and it's like $300. And the other ones they looked at are like 1000 or 1500 And they probably should have gotten the $1,500 one. Um, so they're like, oh, they look the same. Why not save $700? It's cheaper because it's Amish, right? Everything's cheaper from the Amish. Furniture, cheese pies, you know, all of that. And, and it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a, a training in a sense, whereas, you know, spend the money now because, so it doesn't cost you later, you know, I mean, there's so many clients that we get have already been through, you know, another training program, um, that didn't work, you know, and I, and I always tell them if you would have just done a little bit of research, whether you went with us or another reputable company, if you would have just done a little bit of research, you would have saved yourself a thousand dollars. Cause look, you're already, you know, spending money now with us. You already wasted a thousand dollars. Actually, we had, you know, somebody who was in here uh, yesterday that was kind of uh, going through that exact same issue. 
So, you know, it's definitely um, just one of those things to where you really got to do your research for the most part. Yeah, we actually just had a comment I'll, I'll read from Angie. She said they actually rescued a breeding bitch from one of these places in Pennsylvania. Extremely poor health, health left her to die after, uh, after she had complications from delivery. Uh, she had a short, happy life with us. So again, that's what I'm talking about. I would say without, and I'm going to take shit from this from someone, but... I've never, I can honestly say this, I, I've seen a lot of dogs as everyone knows at this point. I've never seen one from like an Amish breeder in like Pen the Pennsylvania, anything like that, that I thought it was a, like an amazing dog uh, ever. I've, oh. ne I've never seen one where I'm like, wow, this dog's awesome. Like great health, great genetics, great temperament, you know, no issues. And I'm not saying they don't exist to clarify for everyone out there. I'm just saying that's my personal experience and they're just not doing the right things. Like Stephanie, like what good breeders should do, good breeders should already get them in a, a training, kind of a, a, a training program, like Stephanie with her mouths. When they're six weeks old, I saw her do it. A, a great video if you wanna watch is I did a Facebook Live with Stephanie about six months ago. And with her puppies, with her mouth puppies, dude, at like four or five weeks old, she has them in the ball pits. You know the the ball pits. She's have she's doing like marker training and free shaping on treadmills, so the dogs get used to jumping on treadmills and running on treadmills. Yeah. She's doing you know she'll take them on the ATV and they're like following the ATV around the ranch. They're going over different obstacles and they're getting noise desensitization and object desensitization. And she's taking them places and people's coming over, so they're getting socialization. They're staying with their litter mates. So that's how it should be as a, a good breeder should be doing all these things where I just feel like the Amish, they're having them, they put them in a kennel, post them on a website, <laughs> six, seven weeks goes by, they're just waiting for someone to show up with three, 400 bucks cash and they're pulling it out of the crate that it's been in for the last six weeks and they're not doing all the fundamental things that a puppy needs to, and they're missing, and they're not, I, I assume, they're not eating amazing food. So if you go back to what, good friend and legend George Hickok says, what do they need? Genetics, nutrition, and training. And I don't feel like they have any of those three. Yeah. They're, they're not using the top dogs in the world to breed them. So they don't have the genetics. They're probably not feeding them amazing food, like high nutrition foods. So they don't have the nutrition. And I don't feel like they're doing things like Stephanie does where they're doing objects and noise and socialization and all these things that she does. I, so I feel like they're missing all those three elements. And, and to clarify, I don't, I don't want anybody to think that we're talking shit about we're just pinpointing out the, the Amish, right? Because No, this is a problem past them. Right. Like every backyard breeder... And, and, and we're backyard not, breeder with Amish, and there you go. Right, and then we're not saying that they're, you know, complete crap people because, I mean, they, Amish, for example, do a lot of things really well. Like, you know, they build sheds really well, you know. So breeding may just not be their forte. So, and that's okay. And, you know, if you're a backyard breeder and you're listening, you know, take a step back and realize that, you know, maybe, maybe I'm pretty shitty at this and I should stop doing it. But on the other hand, maybe I'm really good at, I don't know, uh, playing video games and whatever and figure out a way to make money <laughs> off of that. I don't know. But, Keep making apple pies. Right. But, <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, is if, if you, you know, in the backyard breeders, uh, this goes directly to you They guys. usually know they're shitty. Yeah. You know you're shitty. Stop yeah. it. Stop it. Because you're making the trainers... The owners and the dogs, the dogs, you're putting everyone the vets, in a bad spot. You're putting everyone in a bad spot, and and for what five hundred bucks? Like, come on, man, you're you're not getting rich off of it. So just knock this shit off. I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Yeah, and, and that's why you know we kind of segued into this topic, but. The general point you should take away is find a good place to get your dog, whether it's a breeder, rescue, shelter, wherever it is, doesn't matter. Do a thorough honesty assessment with yourself so you know this is what I need, this is realistic for me, and then test the dogs um, using the, the thing we'll put up for you guys on the website so that way you know exactly what you're getting. And, and if you do get from a breeder, then do your research on that breeder. Go check out the dogs. Ask to meet you know the, the parents of the dogs. Like, just do your research. Don't look at it. Looking at a picture is the worst. You know, well, this is what it's the equivalent of. 
it's literally the equivalent of like you being on like Tinder or something. And because again, remember when you get a dog, you're stuck with them for 15 years, right? right. And about that, you know, 12 to 15, sure. give or take. But would you, this is, this is what you need to be honest and ask yourself. When you pick a dog from a picture, sight unseen, untested, don't know anything about the background, don't know anything about the breed or whatever. You don't know anything about the picture. You're literally saying, I want to go on Tinder as an adult, swipe left, swipe left. Oh, wow, he's hot. Or, oh, wow, she's hot. All right, I want to get married to her tomorrow and be with her for the next 15 years. Yeah. Would anyone ever do that? Oh, yeah, some people. But there's a lot more people that do that with dogs than they do with, with people. And most of you would not do that with a person, but a lot of people would do that with a dog. And same thing, you don't know if that bitch is crazy. You don't know if that dude is controlling and he's abusive. You don't know if he's an alcoholic. You don't know if he hates kids and you want a big family. You don't know anything. You just know that he's attractive. So use that same psychology when you're looking at pictures of dogs. All right, this dog got my attention on the picture. Now I'm gonna actually go out have a date with them, spend some time with them, get to know them, see what he's all about. You would just do the same thing with a person that you would do with a dog. Yeah, totally agree. And, you know, you, you have to, have to, have to do your homework. Now, what, what I will say is this, is, is it possible to go to, example, to the Amish and get a, a, a dog or, you know, go to a backyard breeder and get a dog? And that dog ends up being a perfect fit. Absolutely. Absolutely. We're not saying that that's not possible. You know, there's always that, that exception to every rule, right? There's always that luck, but your odds are so heavily against you. So, you know, if you just perform this simple little test that we're going to put up on the uh, website, which is the dog show podcast.com uh, today, if you just do that little test and you, I promise you, you're going to figure out, you know, is this dog perfect for my family? Um, and, and more so you're taking your emotions out of it. Cause that's the biggest thing. That's something that, uh, that I feel like happens more so than not. Whereas they see that dog, you know, for the first time and the dog's excited. Of course it is because it's been sitting in a pen for the last six months. So, you know, the dog's excited to see them. They think that, you know, this dog chose me. That may be the case, but that does not mean that the dog is a good fit for you or your family or and your family. So, you know, definitely uh, take a look at this test when we put it up later today. And, uh, you know, and, and even if you have a dog and you're not shopping for a dog, you know, look at this test and, and ask yourself, did I do this with, you know, with my current dog or dogs, you know, and, you know, for a future pick, then you have an idea to go off of. Because I promise you, it's going to save you a lot of headache, uh, time, money, you know, and, and frustration, stress. <laughs> I mean, name all the negative shit that you can think of. It's going to it's going to save you all of that. So let me ask you a question. Uh, out of out of one out of ten, what would you feel? And I think I know the answer to this, but I want to know an honest answer. One out of ten, what would you feel the importance level, Nick, of of running through this test prior to picking a dog would be? I would say a ten. Yeah? Yeah, if ten's the most important, I would say a ten. Because again, you're it's not like it's a first date. Like you're stuck with this dog for and, and if you feel like you're stuck with the dog for fifteen years, that probably means you didn't do the test. But you know, as I always say, a dog should complement your life, not complicate it. But yeah, I feel it's it's a 10 out of 10 importance just so you know or have a really good idea of exactly what you're getting. And then you can mold it from there. You know, if a dog comes with like a little bit of issue, like, all right, you can use training, you can use confidence building, you can use things to tweak it. But some dogs, they're just going to be that way forever. You can improve upon it, but at the end of the day, they're still going to be that way. And that's why George stresses the, the things of, you know, genetics, nutrition, and, and training is you can you can you know be not that great genetically and make up for it some in nutrition but you'll never be comparable against the guy who is that way genetically and he's doing the nutrition and training yeah. so now you said you mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago would you say get a dog to complicate or complement your life and not complicate it yeah get a dog that complements your life not complicates your life and that's beautifully said because you know again going off of that piggybacking off of that you know you get a dog because 
it's supposed to be fun. You know, uh, you know, that's, that's why we get dogs. We don't, you get a dog and, and you're stressed out all the time like that. You got to look, that's not why you got one, you know? I mean, it's just like, why? It's like, it's like being in a relationship where you're always pissed off at the other person. It's like, why are you in that relationship? Oh then? my God, yes, absolutely. That's a great analogy, actually. So, you know, definitely ensure, ensure, ensure that the dog you pick is for the long haul. And I promise you that if everybody did that who gets dogs, and I know this is, you know, this is highly impossible because not everyone is going to do that. But if everyone in the country who got dogs... Uh, ran through this test, I promise you our shelters would be a lot less full, right? If, if people did the test and were honest with themselves, yeah. both of those are important. Yep. Because if you do the test but you're not honest with yourself, you let emotions yeah, take you're fifty percent. You've already lost fifty percent. Yeah. So, so if if you do the test, you're honest with yourself. I promise you, there's going to be a lot less dogs in the shelter. There's going to be a lot less uh, uh, shitty breeders out there. You because know? no one's going to get those dogs. Yeah. Because if everyone's testing the dogs and they're like, oh, these are shitty dogs, no one's going to get them, which now they have no reason to breed because no one's buying their dogs anyway. So it eliminates a lot of things. So where do they start? Where do they start? If they want to get, say they want to go to a breeder, how do they find a, I mean, is Google the place to go, Nick? Or, you know, what, what are your yeah, suggestions? Yeah, I mean, I would try to ask some trainers in your area first, like, you know, reach out to trainers wherever you're at. Hey, I'm looking at a German Shepherd for a therapy dog or a protection dog. Can you recommend anyone? Because generally, a lot of trainers know a lot of breeders. That's usually how it works. So I would say that'd be the first step is reach out to some trainers in your area and just say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. This is the type of dog I'm looking for. Do you know anyone that has dogs that meet this criteria? And I think that would be a good first step. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that as well. I would definitely uh, go to your local trainer that, that's uh, you know reputable and talk to them. And honestly, if, if your local trainer that you selected to help uh, identify good breeders for you doesn't know any good breeders uh, at all, then they're probably not a good training company as well. So take that into consideration. So you can shop around, uh, you know, for trainers just as much as you can shop around for dogs, you know. So I, I would say that would be step one is find the best trainer in your area. And if, even if he's not in your area, if you're not opposed to, you know, flying or driving somewhere to get a dog, you know, hit up a uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin trainer that you, uh, you know is, is awesome. See if they have any recommendations of local breeders for the specific, you know, dog that you're looking for. And if they do, then you know, even better than your one, one foot in the door, you know, maybe even vets offices. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Or vets. I mean, anyone that works with a lot of dogs generally knows a lot of other people that works with dogs. So that's a, a kind of good rule to follow. And then do your own research. I mean, what's the, the facility look like that you're showing up, you know, like if you're showing up to a place and they got seven puppies crammed in a small pen, then that kind of tells you a lot about them, you know, or if the dogs look mangy and you know dirty yeah. and you know just use common sense i would say that a lot of people don't because they get so emotionally involved in the dog in the picture absolutely all right guys so we are going to post all of that stuff on our website um we'll also post it in the comment section if you're watching uh on facebook live uh we'll post the news stories as well um what do you have going on? Uh, what, what, any events or anything going on in the next week or two or anything going coming up? Yeah, in like five days, I go to Naples, Italy to train a, a, actually a German Shepherd, a seven-month-old German Shepherd for a family there. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I've never been to Italy. Where did they get the dog from? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, no clue. But I'm going to Naples, Italy uh, the 10th. So what is that? Like five days I leave. And I'm really excited. I plan to crush an insane amount of cheese and wine while I'm there and some pasta. Italy's beautiful. So if I don't gain at least 10 pounds while I'm in Naples, I feel like I did myself a disservice off wine and pasta and pizza. So I'm excited about that. Then I get back from there and I have a private seminar in Austin, Texas <laughs> for a... Uh, uh, lovely young woman by the name of Mia Khalifa. Google her, guys. Do it right now. Uh, if you're at work, do it. Yeah, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> um, so I got that going on. Mia Khalifa seminar for her two dogs. 
And then I get back from there and I have Vinny from Jersey Shore. I'm going up to Jersey to train Vinny from the MTV show's Jersey Shore's dog. Cab's here. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's my immediate itinerary that we have lined up. Sweet. What about you? Anything exciting? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have, uh, as I mentioned last week, I was getting uh, back into uh, to some training uh, this week, which I did. I picked up Miss Clover, I believe, Monday or Tuesday. Um, anyhow, she is, oh my God, you got to see her. She is a gorgeous uh, six-month-old uh, chocolate lab. She is just absolutely perfect, man. She, uh, she has a great disposition. She's going to be a service dog. Uh, for an eight-year-old uh, autistic kid, highly autistic kid, and she is a perfect candidate uh, for that. She is uh, she is very loyal, um, eager to please, uh, highly, highly intelligent, and she's just absolutely adorable. So I'm having a ball with her. I think we're on day three right now with her, and you know we got her off leash, doing all the commands now. So pretty happy about that. And then, uh, you know, obviously you're going to start with some distractions. Um, and then next week I get uh, Shake and Bake, Baker from New York and his new brother Sherman. Uh, Baker's going to be here for three-week detection board and train. Uh, those, as you know, are my favorite. <laughs> um, and Sherman, his brother, is going to be here for some obedience. Um, some other things we have going on. Um, we do have a Facebook page now for the dog show with Nick and Joe. Uh, if you type in facebook.com slash, I believe it's the dog show podcast is our Facebook page. If you wouldn't mind, go over there and, uh, give it the old like button. And, uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing it, we'd greatly appreciate it. We are live, not live technically, but we are on iTunes now. Um, I think we had record timing of our episode one from getting up there. Uh, we filmed it last Friday and I believe it was up Saturday morning. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was up pretty quick. So if you check in your iTunes, yep. click where the podcast app, uh, manually type in the dog show with Nick and Joe, and you can listen to it on your commute to work in the shower, wherever you want to listen to it at. Yep. No doubt. And we also have, uh, we are also, I believe we're on Google play. Um, now, if not, I know we're heading there, um, where you can, uh, even Alexa, I think we're even on Alexa where you can go talk to her and say, Alexa, play the Naked Dog Show episode one and, and she'll start playing it for you, which is pretty kick ass. I, uh, I love <laughs> Alexa. Do you have that? I do. Man, I do. Dude, I have them. I feel like in my facility, I have them in like every room and then in my house, I want them in every room, you know? Yeah. It, she's, she's pretty intelligent for sure. It's the most <laughs> amazing. Thing I just ever. love being able to play any song in the world on demand. How, I don't even know how that's possible, but yeah, that is amazing absolutely amazing so other than that oh you guys can contact us we'd love to get emails from you on um maybe future topics for the show the show ideas questions, questions yeah. yeah for sure anything like that so you can reach us uh nick and i both at where can they reach us info at, at the dog show podcast.com that's info at the dog show podcast.com so just shoot us an email there if you have some topics you would like to see discussed, whether it's about dog training, news stories, some questions that you have that maybe we can answer on the next podcast. Uh, just feel free to email us anything there. Again, that's info at the dog show podcast.com. And the email address is all also on the website, which is the dog show podcast.com. And, uh, anything else you got going on? No, um, not not really. Not that I can think of. Um, any New Year's resolutions that you had? Man. I mean, we just had January first. Yeah. So, yeah. what re what what New Year's resolutions did you guys have? Anything? If you had any great New Year's resolutions that you plan on sticking to, comment below so I can see what some of the ones you guys had are. What do you have? Anything? Yeah, I'm a huge fan of New Year's yeah. resolutions, and and I didn't even realize I was a huge fan <laughs> until until, this year. until Facebook memories popped up, and I could see all the years, uh, you know, previous. Um, where I where I posted my New Year's resolutions on Facebook, and I don't know if it's a coincidence, but most of them uh, proved to be uh, that I stuck with it. So that's awesome. So I did make some resolutions this year. Um, Care to share any of them? Yeah, shit. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> what do you got? Uh, what do I got? Uh, I wanna I want to focus on my health 
you know, eating better, stuff like that. That's a tough one for me. It's a tough one. Especially since I'm getting ready to go to Italy and vowed to gain at least 10 pounds. You should start when you come back from Italy. <laughs> uh, so that was one. Um, obviously, you know, I always, you know, want to be a better father, husband, brother, son, all that stuff. So, you know, that's high up on my list. And then, uh, you know, I have some New Year resolutions, you know, for other people that I don't necessarily have a whole lot of control over. But I do hope that that it happens for them. Health, wealth, and happiness for all. Absolutely. That's that's huge for me. So what about you? How do you feel nah, about New Year's resolutions? I'm not, as you know, I'm not a big New Year's resolution guy. I mean, I just, I just do me. <laughs> I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, anyone that knows me, I mean, whether you're a trainer or someone that knows me personally, knows I'm super self-critical. Like, nothing's ever good enough for me, for myself, meaning... Um, whether, I mean, if you guys watch my videos, my before and after videos over two years, you'll see the, the evolution. You'll see like, wow, this is impressive for a five day after video. And then the one I just shot in Hollywood Boulevard last week um, for UFC's Ariane Celeste, it was a one day before and after video. So it's like just nothing's ever good enough for me the way it is. That's just my personality. That's how I was in the Marines. That's how I was in the Secret Service. It's just, so I feel like I'm always trying to level up daily um and but, but don't you don't you feel at least this is the way i feel that it's almost a reset button right like we can hit that reset button on january 1st and obviously it's all mental but you can hit that reset button and go all right new year new me right that's what everybody seems to say and so my thoughts on the resolutions are if if you actually stick to it, <laughs> it's 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 worth it. It's uh it's something good. You know, if your new year resolution, I think the most popular one is probably you lose know, weight, lose weight, get in the gym, more stuff money. Like that. Yeah, of course. You know, if you can actually stick to that the entire year and you know fulfill it, then hell yeah, I'm I'm all about it. Go for it. Yeah, um, I mean whatever whatever helps. You know, if if you feel like. Having a New Year's resolution makes you feel better than, um, I mean, I always say whatever helps you, you know, don't worry about anyone else or what their opinion is. If if you feel like making a resolution makes you a better person, then I'm all for it. Yeah. If you feel like you don't need one, it's a waste of time, then I'm all for that as well. <laughs> so, um, I hear you. So anything else going on? Anybody comment on resolutions or anything? And for those who are listening on the podcast, we do stream this live every Friday at 2 p.m. on our uh, Off Leash K9 Training LLC headquarters Facebook page. So you are welcome to uh, screw off and work doing absolutely nothing and watching us while you're doing it. So, you know, feel free to do that. And uh, obviously, we appreciate everybody's support uh, more than you know. But uh, anything else you got going on? No, I think think that's that about wraps it up so what what i'm gonna do guys is we're gonna put uh, that that test i'm gonna have darcy who's our website lady uh do something she, she'll she figure it out put it up on our website the dog show podcast.com i'll put the website in the comments now so you guys have it it'll definitely be up today uh, but she'll put up that test and it's in a pdf i created so you guys can print it out and you can use it or and and what i encourage before we close out, is if you have friends or family that you know who is thinking about getting a dog, then now you take this information and give it to them. Like you be the hero and say, hey, this is something you guys should do. So now it prevents them from hardship in the future. So I would highly recommend sharing it and uh, we'll have it up on the website. I just commented the website below just now. We'll have it up there at some point today. Check back. And it'll be up there for you guys. Absolutely. All right, guys. We appreciate you Wait, all. Wait, hold on. And before you close out, do you think it's okay to ask a bitch to sit? Nope. Why not? Well, I I do think it's okay. I apologize. I do think it's okay, actually. Okay. Well, I guess just, you guys will have to... Let's tune in next week. See what tune the, in next week. See what we're talking about. See what about. the hell we're talking about. Yeah.